Good morning. I regret that I misnamed the composer of this first piece. Uh, totally my fault. The real composer is Joe Raposo. We're opening this morning with a lesson in self-acceptance from that famous Sesame Street philosopher, Kermit the Frog. It's not that easy being green, having to spend each day the color of the leaves. When I think it could be nicer being red or yellow or gold or something much more colorful like that. It's not easy being green. It seems you blend in with so many other ordinary things. And people tend to pass you over because you're not standing out like flashy sparkles in the water or stars in the sky. But green is the color of spring. And green can be cool and friendly like And green can be big, like an ocean, or important, like a mountain, or tall, like a tree. When green is all there is to be, it could make you wonder why, but why wonder why? wonder. I am green and it'll do fine. It's beautiful and I think it's what I want to be. Welcome to the First Universalist Church of Rochester, where we are called to nurture the spirit and serve the community. I am Peter House, my pronouns are he, him, and leading the service with me today are Ezekiel McGee as our worship associate, Ann Rohde, Lou Ward Baker for our music, McCormick Chu providing tech support, Lisa Gwinner and Karen Labraco. If you are here for the first time this morning, we especially welcome you. Thank you for making it to this worshiping community. We have a visitor's form that can be found in the chat for our folks online and can be accessed by scanning a QR code in your pews or on the back of your order of service. Please fill out the form so that we can offer you a welcome beyond this worship service. Before we take a moment to turn to our neighbor, let us take a moment and turn toward the camera so that we can greet our online worshiping community. So please offer a wave. And if you're online, please pop into the chat and offer a greeting. So if you are here at First Universalist, let us take a moment to turn to our neighbor this morning and offer a greeting.
And as we wrap up our good mornings, let us sing together hymn number 347, Gather the Spirit. My great uncle Fred was one of my favorite people as a child. Though he passed away when I was very young, I still have happy memories of going to visit him or spending time together in my grandparents' garden. It shocked me to find out years later that my mother had a quite different relationship with Uncle Fred. They never really got along, and to her it seemed he was hostile and even jealous. It didn't sound anything like the kind and sometimes goofy uncle I remembered so fondly. Yet despite her own troubled relationship with my great uncle, my mother was always thankful for the good relationship he and I had. Though it was hard for me to process this knowledge, I believe it was necessary. It taught me that even when it's painful, we have to respect the truths of the people around us. Doing so helps us to build community with those we care for and to make peace with our past, no matter the difficulties that lie behind us. Come, let us worship together. As we light our chalice at First Universalist Church and you light a chalice in your own homes, will you join me in saying our chalice words? <laughs> Goodness. So sorry. Um, love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humanity in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the source and meaning of life. Thus do we covenant with each other and with all.
Our church community grows and thrives through the kindness and thoughtful donations we receive each week. You are invited to give in person by scanning the QR code in your pews or to drop an offering in the offering basket. For folks online, please click the link in the chat to give to First Universalist Church. Thank you for your generosity. In this song from the Broadway musical Parade, a woman is responding to reporters who are asking her about her husband who has been accused of some horrible crimes. You don't know this man You don't know a thing. You come here with these horrifying stories, your contemptible conceits, and you think you understand how a man's heart beats, and you don't know a thing. You don't know this man, you don't even try. When a man writes his mother every Sunday, pays his bills before they're due, works so hard to feed his family, there's your murderer for you. And you stand here spitting words that you know aren't true. Well, you don't know this man. I don't think you could. You don't have the right to know a man. from me, not from anyone who knows him, not a morsel, not a crumb, not a clue. I have nothing more to say to you. I invite you now into this reverent time of sharing the joys and sorrows of our gathered community. If you would like to, you can place your hand over your heart to be able to listen from this heart-centered place. As we place stones into a bowl, I will read aloud the joys and sorrows of our gathered community. All online are also invited to share your joys and your sorrows in the chat. From Jean and Joe Ott, a joy, a joy that we got to spend a wonderful 4th of July weekend with the Ott family at the beach in North Carolina, and a sorrow that COVID decided to also visit with some of us. 
We tested positive Monday night in our daughter on Tuesday morning after returning home. A joy from David D'Amico, a big joy, professional teaching certification, July 4th. I assume that means it's all done, and I think I saw a picture of it online. And we drop one final stone into the bowl to represent all the joys and sorrows left unspoken in the silent sanctuaries of our hearts. May all be held in the heart of love. Oh, thank you. There is one more. I had a book. I have a screen. I have a screen. <laughs> one more joy. The Pride Parade at first, 35 people from First Universalist participated by marching or watching or cheering. Stay tuned for photos of the event in the next Outlook. I invite you now to join with me in a spirit of prayer and meditation. As we gather together, may we remember when you share with me what is most important to you, that is where listening begins. When I show you that I hear you, when I say your life matters. That is where compassion begins. When I open the door to greet you, that is where hospitality begins. When I venture out to bring you to shelter, that is where love begins. When I risk my comfort to ease your suffering, when I act against hatred, violence, and injustice, that is where courage begins. When we experience the full presence of each other because of our shared humanity, because of our differences, that is where holy gratitude begins. May this space be a table that is not complete until all are welcome. May this table be a space of beauty where together we create a series of miracles and where all that we share is sacred. May it be so. Amen.
I'm probably going to sound for a minute like a, an old fuddy-duddy, but the service is exponentially more complicated than it used to be to coordinate. So my apologies for any glitches that happened this morning. My Aunt Jean knew that she was dying before Christmas. In October, she had gone in for a routine chest x-ray, and they discovered that renal cell carcinoma had metastasized to several different organs, including both lungs. Thanksgiving came along a few weeks later, and already by then, she had exhausted her second and third and even fourth opinions. They all agreed that she had no more than six months or so, and they also all agreed that there was very little that they could do. So Thanksgiving was a somber affair for those of us that were there. We had been having Thanksgiving at Aunt Jean's house for probably about 40 years at this point. But this year, we all brought parts of the meal with us so that she didn't have to cook. And no one actually talked about it, but everyone understood that this was the last holiday that would ever be held in that familiar setting. It was a pleasant day though, and Aunt Jean that day was in very good spirits. There was a dramatic change in her condition, however, by Christmas Eve, where on Thanksgiving she had been cheerful and had fully participated in the day. Christmas Eve she sat quietly on the end of my mother's couch, refusing the snacks and drinks that people brought for her, and clearly she was having trouble even staying awake. Her sons and her daughter-in-law kept a watchful eye on her, ran interference for her when people were tiring her out with conversation, and they whisked her home at the first sign that she said she was ready to go. Between my mother and my male cousins, Aunt Jean's care was covered very well. They took turns taking her to all of her appointments. They talked with the doctors together. They made her meals. They arranged for visits with members of the extended family. She and my mother had lots and lots of cousins, all of whom adored Aunt Jean and all of whom wanted quality time to say goodbye. And then it wasn't just her own relatives. Her in-laws wanted to come as well, and there were lots of them too. And then there were friends. Aunt Jean had lots and lots and lots of friends, many of whom went way back to first grade at Holy Family High School. Seventy year long friendships. There were the neighbors, there were the members of the knitting club, co-members and co-workers that she had worked with for 31 years that she worked in the children's room at Seymour Public Library. Frankly, too many people wanted to see her. She really did not have the energy or the stamina to see everybody who wanted to visit her. My mother and my cousins had to start finding tactful ways to turn people away. So many people wanted to spend time with her. And as sad as a time as it was, it was also gratifying to see how many people from all the various times and places and seasons in Aunt Jean's life adored her. It was definitely, in my opinion, evidence of a life well lived. However, there was one glaring void in the middle of this love fest. My cousin Laura. You see, Aunt Jean didn't just have the sons who now doted on her. She also had a daughter, my cousin Laura. Laura was and still is a divorced mother of two who lives in California. So everybody understood why she wasn't there round the clock the way my mother and Aunt Jean's sons were. But it was more than that. Laura wasn't there at all. Surely she could have come briefly for Thanksgiving or Christmas and brought her two daughters to say goodbye to their grandmother. I can assure you, money wasn't a problem. Laura was and still is constantly boasting about her high power career, her six figure income, and her annual trips to Europe. So surely she could have managed three tickets from San Jose to Syracuse. But we never saw her. She called occasionally, and Aunt Jean would listen to news of the girls, Laura's career triumphs, and the details of Laura's re-kitchen model. 
The conversation would usually touch ever so briefly on Aunt Jean's health, but the bulk of the conversation would always be spent with Aunt Jean listening to Laura talk about her own life. You know how families are. So while this was going on, my mother became more and more and more frustrated and impatient with Laura. As Thanksgiving and Christmas came and went, and Aunt Jean saw the year change for the last time, I just don't understand Laura, my mother kept saying to me. Her mother is dying, and she can't visit for a few days? She can't call more often, and when she does call, you'd think she'd be more interested in her mother's health than she would be in what color countertops she's having put in. No one ever had a more wonderful mother than that girl had. She should be ashamed of herself. So as January went on and Aunt Jean got sicker and weaker each day, my mother became more and more and more frustrated with Laura. What is wrong with that girl? She kept saying. On January 31st, Aunt Jean woke up with a new pain that she had not felt before. And for the first time, she couldn't get out of bed. It was time for her to be admitted to the hospital. When she got there, the test showed that her condition was deteriorating even more quickly than had previously been thought. Her sons were hovering around her. My mother was there. I was there. My sisters were there. But still, there was no sign of her daughter. Well, my mother had finally had enough. In spite of the fact that my two sisters and I advised her to stay out of it, my mother decided that it was high time that she called Laura and took her to task for her neglect. Actually, I got the call right after. I just talked to Laura and she gave me the report. What a nice surprise, Laura said upon hearing my mother's voice. Well, I'm actually calling about your mother, my mother said. Oh no, is something wrong, Laura asked. <laughs> At this point, my mother was incredulous. Of course something was wrong. I mean, just how dense and self-centered was her niece? Well, my mother let Laura know in no uncertain terms that yes, a lot was wrong. Very wrong perhaps as wrong as it could possibly be. My mother couldn't believe, she was incredulous, she couldn't believe that she had to explain all of this at this late stage of the ordeal. Was Laura really so self-centered, so wrapped up in her idyllic West Coast life that she didn't even listen when her mother talked? This is how my mother recounted the rest of the conversation to me. Well, my mother said, according to Laura, Aunt Jean told her just before Christmas that she had a small tumor on one of her kidneys and that after the holidays, she would have minor surgery to remove it and she would be just fine. You sound like you don't believe Laura, I said. I can't believe she didn't know better, my mother replied. How could she not know better? What did she think was happening here? Didn't she ever think to ask her mother how everything was? And anyway, my mother went on, any daughter who cared about her mother would have visited in all of this time at least once, especially after she heard her mother had a tumor. Well, we've all had mothers, most of us. So I tried a few times to kind of get my mother to entertain just the possibility that maybe, just maybe, Laura really hadn't known any better. Was it possible, I tried to ask a few times, that just maybe Aunt Jean really had glossed over what was wrong and that Laura really did believe that this was just a minor health problem? I mean, if you think about the distance from here to California and all you're getting is a phone call, it's easy to not have a full picture. So I tried that with my mother, but mm, I know my sister, my mother replied, she would never keep something that important from her daughter. But even after this conversation, Laura didn't come home. Not until the very last few days when her mother was in hospice. And while it had always been true that my mother had never really understood her niece, 
she had always generally held her in a positive regard until now. But after these months of Aunt Jean's illness and subsequent death, my mother was disgusted with Laura, a vain, selfish, self-centered, ungrateful daughter who didn't care about or appreciate the most wonderful mother in the world. And that was my mother's narrative about Laura. My sisters and I tried several times after Aunt Jean's death to get our mother to entertain the idea that maybe, just maybe, there were some aspects of that mother-daughter relationship that she didn't see or didn't understand. After all, while our two families were close, we weren't with them all of the time. We couldn't possibly be privy to everything that went on between Aunt Jean and Laura over 43 years of Laura's life. Wasn't it possible that perhaps Laura knew and understood the dynamics of her own relationship with her own mother better than we could ever hope to? I knew my sister, my mother would insist though, I knew her better than almost anyone, and I saw what kind of a mother she was to those kids, why they were her whole life. No, you will never convince me that Laura had any good reason to behave like she did. And that is how things remained. For the six years between my Aunt Jean's death and my mother's death, my mother held firm to the belief that she knew and understood absolutely everything she needed to understand about the relationship between her sister and her niece. So to anyone here this morning who has ever been part of a family, I'm guessing that at least parts of this story will no doubt sound familiar. It can be so easy incredibly easy to fall into the trap of assuming that just because we are close to people and just because we have known them for a long time and spent a lot of time with them that we understand absolutely everything there is to understand about them often better than they understand it themselves and i think this is especially true with older members of the family looking at younger members I believe it's something that we all do at times, and I believe it is at the root of a lot of the drama and a lot of the conflict that we put ourselves and our loved ones through. A child or a sibling or even a friend decides to marry someone we know is wrong for them, and we feel it's our duty to speak up. Or two people we love fall out with each other and we just know that there's no substance to it at all, and we lecture them on harmony without ever really entertaining the substance of the conflict in the first place. Or our sibling isn't doting over mom the way we are, and we take them to task without ever really considering the possibility that maybe, just maybe, there are issues between them that we don't know about. Or maybe our sibling has a different set of personal circumstances and challenges that we couldn't even guess at. Because we live, each and every one of us, round the clock in our own minds, it is so very easy for all of us to fall into living as if our own thoughts, our own feelings, our own perceptives, our own perspectives, and our own narratives are reality itself. And so we move through the world as if we are the sole arbiters of reality itself. When my partner, Michael, was in the process of coming out, several of his friends insisted that he wasn't gay. You're just confused, they said. You're just feeling this way because you've never had any luck with women. Another friend said, someone has put this notion into your head. You've always been impressionable, but this isn't really who you are. The overriding message of all of this was, we know you better than you know yourself. Our perceptions of who you are are more valid than your experience of yourself is. Trust us to be the arbiters when it comes to who you really are and how you really feel. This is a common experience for queer people. Most recently, we are seeing this phenomenon play out with our transgendered friends. 
In recent years, I've known a large number of trans people, and I can tell, I cannot even begin to tell you how many times I've heard people say things like this when they're out of earshot. It's just a phase. They are confused. They're just doing this to hurt their parents. They're doing this for the attention. They're doing this because it's trendy right now. As if people would voluntarily open themselves up to all of the challenges and heartbreak that can, that can accompany transitioning simply because they wanted to be cool. As if they could not possibly be capable of knowing themselves from the inside better and more holistically than everyone else thinks they know them. A number of years ago, my sister worked in a large medical office. The secretarial staff was comprised completely of white women until Stephanie was hired. Stephanie was a young, extremely petite African-American woman, and everyone seemed to like Stephanie. And I could tell that her presence also provided the white women with a reason to feel good about themselves. My sister was always boasting about how accepting everyone was of Stephanie and how inclusive that they were all being. Why, she goes out to lunch with us on Fridays and everything, they would tell me. We are so inclusive. So all of this self-congratulatory patting themselves on the back came to an end, however, when my sister and her white colleagues were told that Stephanie had filed a complaint with HR. Stephanie felt that she was often singled out and treated differently because of her race. One example that I recall that Stephanie gave was that she was always the one that was asked to go to the mail room and bring the mail back. But that, that has nothing to do with her race, my sister insisted when she told me the story. We just asked her to do that because she's the newest and that's always what the new girl does because she's got the least to do. The new girl always does that job. And as I did with my mother and the whole issue with Laura, I tried asking my sister if she thought it was just possible that maybe as the only person of color in an all white workplace, that just perhaps Stephanie saw things no one else saw. Was it possible that Stephanie's life experience just might give her a very different perspective on everything that went on in the office? Did she understand that as a white person living in a white dominated world, she couldn't understand what Stephanie's experience was and she was not capable of seeing things that Stephanie could easily see? Was it, I asked her, even remotely possible that Stephanie might just be the expert in this situation? No, my sister replied, it wasn't. Ironically, she reminded me that I, of course, didn't work there, and she did. So I needed to take her word for it. She and her co-workers were not racist, not even a little bit. Stephanie had just decided to make some trouble so she could get ahead. Why, we even let her bring her sister to Karen shower, my sister said. Now, would we do that if we were racist? So to be clear, I know my sister and I knew some of these co-workers and they are kind and decent people. I believe that they truly tried to be welcoming to Stephanie and I believe that they all believed that there wasn't anything racist about anything that they did. They simply couldn't see beyond the limits of their own interpretations and their own perceptions and their own experience of the world. And while the example of my sister and Stephanie is more overt and clear cut than these situations usually are, I think we're all guilty at times of failing to treat everyone, even those that we are close to, as the unqualified experts on their own experience. As Mr. Rogers was always reminding us, no one is you but you. You are unique and you are special. That uniqueness extends to our experience of the world. No one, no other person can see things exactly as we see them, but us.
So a few years after my mother died, my cousin Laura was passing through Rochester, and she called me and asked me to have dinner with her. As if reading my mind, once we had ordered and settled down for conversation, she said, I know everyone thought I was horrible for not being here when my mother died. I fought the usual social urge to falsely assure her, oh, no one thought that. <laughs> and I decided the best thing to do would be to just let her talk. And what she told me really did not come as a total surprise. I had seen glimpses of what she had to say our entire lives. I just hadn't really processed it and thought about it and put it together as a whole. First of all, she began, my mother really didn't tell me what was going on. She really did tell me that she just had a small tumor and that she was going to be fine. I shared with her that my mother always said that if there were any truth to that, Aunt Jean told Laura only to protect her from worrying. The reason she didn't tell her the whole truth was because she didn't want her to worry. Laura smiled. She did it mostly to protect herself. And I don't blame her at all, she went on. My mother and I were like oil and water, she continued. We couldn't get along more than 10 minutes. My mother was already not feeling well and she knew that having me around would drive her crazy. Now, as I said, I had caught glimpses of this dynamic over the years, but I had never realized how prevalent it was, nor how much it really defined their relationship with one another. Laura went on, and at the funeral, I talked to literally hundreds and hundreds of people who were sure that I had just the very best mother in the whole world. But I didn't, she said. She was sweet, and she was charming, and she was kind and humorous when other people were around. But keep in mind, you didn't live with her. Laura went on to explain that while she knew her mother loved her, and in many respects took good care of her, in many important ways, her mother had invalidated her and neglected some important needs that Laura had. Laura's father was a dairy farmer and she had four brothers. They lived way out in the country on a dairy farm in isolation. It was a boy household through and through, Laura said. My mother dressed me like a boy until I was eight years old. And I remember that. I, I was going through some family pictures recently, and I found pictures of Laura wearing the boy's clothes. And when she said that, that memory, a lot of them came right back to me. It was true. I remember when we were little, Laura was just treated like one of the boys. She wore boys' clothes, she played with boys' toys, and she did boys' chores. But when Laura started to assert her femininity and began to balk at being treated as one of the boys, Aunt Jean greeted her newfound assertiveness with a combination of exasperation and amusement. Aunt Jean herself had never been one for makeup or fashion, and she openly mocked and teased Laura when she began to wear makeup and fuss with her hair and insist on being able to choose her own clothes. And I did see that go on sometimes. The boys just wore whatever my father brought home from the Sears clearance rack, whether it fit or not, she said, and my mother never understood why I couldn't do the same. And my, I do remember my uncle doing that. He was a real bargain hunter, and he would go in the store when everything was on sale, and he'd just bring home a big bag and throw it on the kitchen table and say, there's your clothes. Well, how many teenage girls are going to want to do that? So as Laura grew more and more independent, the tension in the household got worse and worse. Aunt Jean essentially never approved of anything that Laura said or did. Now, I had seen this at times, but I had always assumed that it was simply a bit of good-natured sparring. I never stopped to reflect on the fact that it might really be a sign of a deep-seated lack of connection between them or a source of pain for Laura. When dinner was over, I felt a connection to and an understanding of Laura that I had never had before, and I dearly wished that my mother were still alive so that I could share all of this with her. It can be very, very easy, and I think it happens a lot in families, but I think it happens in all social groups. It can be very easy for a narrative to take on a life of its own, and then that's just the complete picture of who a person is. And I really got a different side of this finally that night at dinner. So who are the Lauras and the Aunt Jeans in your lives? 
Whose experience have you maybe discounted or dismissed because it didn't match what you were absolutely sure you knew? Who have you thought you understood better than they understood themselves? Who have you sided against because you bought wholesale the story that somebody that you liked better told you? I've often been a sucker for that one. We don't know anyone, anyone, as well as we think we do. And we certainly never, never know anyone better than they know themselves. Each and every person is the sole and undisputed expert on their own experience. Living lives of compassion and justice means never losing sight of that fact, ever. Even when we're sure we know better. I invite everyone now to join in our closing hymn, number 151, I Wish I Knew How. Please remain standing as we extinguish our chalice flame this morning. Let us read together the words printed on the screen. We extinguish, we extinguish this, flame, this flame, but we keep its light in our hearts with its message of love and justice, taking it outside these walls to the world we live in until we are together again. As we close our service this morning, I invite you to place a hand over your heart. If you are joining us online, I invite you to turn your settings to gallery view and look upon the faces of those here with you. 
For those of us in the room, take a moment to look around at those here with you today. I would also like to invite everyone to refreshments after the service. There is too much hardship in this world to not find joy every day. There's too much injustice in this world to not right the balance every day. There's too much pain in the world to not heal every day. Each of us ministers to a weary world. Let us go forth and do that which calls us to make this world more loving, more compassionate, and more filled with the grace of the divine presence every day. And let the people of the church say together, Amen. Do you love me? Do I what? Do you love me? Do I love you? With our daughters getting married and this trouble in the town, you're upset, you're worn out, go inside, go lie down. Maybe it's indigestion. Golga, I'm asking you a question. Do you love me? You're a fool. I know. Do you love me? Do I love you? Well, for 25 years I've washed your clothes, cooked your meals, cleaned your house, given you children, milked the cow. After 25 years, why talk about love right now? The first time I met you was on our wedding day. I was scared. I was shy. I was nervous. So was I. But my father and my mother said we'd learn to love each other. And now I ask you, Golda, do you love me? I'm your wife. I know. Do you love me? Do I love him? For 25 years I've lived with him, fought with him, starved with him. 25 years my pet is his. If that's not love, what is? Then you love me. I suppose I do. And I Suppose I love you too. It doesn't change a thing, but even so, after 25 years, 